Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching TheAnalysis.News. You're watching part three of my conversation with Paul Jay on global capitalism, the climate crisis, and U.S. competition with China. Before we get to it, it would be great if you could go to our website, TheAnalysis.News, to support the work that we do. You can hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen and get onto our mailing list. That way you'll receive an email every time there's a new episode. You can also go to our YouTube channel, The Analysis-News, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. The bell ensures that you'll get a YouTube notification every time a new episode drops. See you in a bit with Paul. Well, it seems like the unifying thread throughout all of the Biden administration's foreign policy is just not appearing weak. Like they just do not want to appear weak. So you could say that, for example, uh, you know, looking at Biden's policy on Iran, his whole campaign was about getting the U.S. back into the JCPOA, into the Iran nuclear deal. But, you know, even before the protests, he didn't seem so uh, keen on doing that. And then with the protests in Iran, he didn't you know, want to appear weak by rejoining a deal with a government that was oppressing its own people, or at least that was a perception and didn't want to potentially lose the 2020, well, if he runs again, wouldn't want to lose the 2024 um, presidential elections. So it seems like the policy has no real continuity. And I'm not advocating any weapons deliveries here, but if you actually look at the U.S.'s commitment to Taiwan, like they have contracts with Taiwan where they need to deliver a certain amount of weapons. And because they're not necessarily producing more weapons, they're sending their weapon stocks to Ukraine, but they're not necessarily fulfilling their uh, obligations or contractual obligations to the Taiwanese. So if, if there were to be a war with China, and let's hope there, there won't be, but if there were to be one, there could be actual issues there with um, weapons deliveries. Well, I think I think the the the, the, the Millies of this world, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, the Biden administration, anybody that really knows knows that we are not in any way going to see an imminent threat from China to Taiwan. The Chinese have no plans to invade Taiwan, certainly anytime soon. They certainly, their plan is over time. Um, Taiwan will be even more uh, immersed in the Chinese economy. I mean, how can they not be? Like the, the Chinese semiconductor company, which is, you know, the, I think the biggest in the world, one of their biggest plants is in China. I mean, mainland China. Uh, the Chinese are still a big market for Taiwan. Uh, very big. And as time goes on, that, that will that will increase. Uh, and, and, you know, w whether it's 10 years, 20 years, uh, there'll be a kind of more natural progression. And in fact, if it hadn't been for the Chinese so coercively cracking down in Hong Kong after uh, it was returned to China, um, I, the p people I've talked to in Taiwan and polling I've seen, uh, most of the Taiwanese were, you know, resigned or welcomed the idea of one country, two systems, and that Taiwan would have a special status within China and kind of carry on the way it is, because you know, it's not like China can't live with a capitalist Taiwan. Um, but after that crackdown in Hong Kong, it really changed a lot of the Taiwanese mindset. But even that said, there's no need or impulse for China to start some invasion of Taiwan. It's just, and, and I think the American leadership mostly know that. Um, I don't know that the, the Christian nationalist Trumpists would be very rational about that. Th what I'm describing is a rational imperialist policy uh, where there's just no point of trying to start something in Taiwan. Because every, uh, like Larry Wilkerson said many times, every game, every modeling of a fight over Taiwan that the armed forces have done goes nuclear because they can't deal with Chinese conventional forces. There's just no way. So America, you know, the United States gets to a position where they're going to be humiliated. And rather than be humiliated, 
the Americans will use nuclear weapons. So I don't think we're going down that road, not with corporate Dems and the finance sector and Apple's and all these guys. Do you really think they're going to give up on a billion and a half people market? Not easily. Uh, that's not what that's not what they want. See, the, the basic problem, I think, for the American elites, excluding the fanatics on the far right, they don't know what the hell to do. When you say the policy seems confused, well, it's very confused because I'll give you an example. There's one company that epitomizes the problem. Boeing. One of their important clients, markets, is Taiwan. They sell lots of weapons to Taiwan. Maybe it's in their top, I'm not sure. I think it's in the top 20 of purchasers. But in 2020, at least, that's the last numbers I could see, the number one customer for Boeing domestic aircraft was China. So this in one company, one division wants almost war over Taiwan so they can keep selling shit military supplies. The other side wants to reduce tensions because they want to be able to sell domestic aircraft. Uh, it's completely... It, it, see, the fundamental thing is capitalism has always been basically irrational, but it's never been as irrational it is, as it is now. So you can't get a coherent strategy because there's such conflicting interests. So it's not like, and this is what differentiates to some extent, corporate Dems finance sector from the Trump types, they know there's a climate crisis. And you can hear John Kerry, you can hear Al Gore, even you, know, you can hear Biden. They know how to describe it. They know it's how dangerous it is. They know it's coming. But they also know, but won't say, that the only way to deal with it is central planning. And uh, government regulation and intervention. They know the market mechanisms aren't going to work, certainly not within a time frame that matters, if at all. Um, and they're not against central planning. I mean, what was the bailout of the banks, if not central planning? What is the Pentagon, if not central planning? What is the Fed, if not central planning? Central planning in their interests is okay and under their control. But government regulation and central planning that's going to start transforming the economy to phase out fossil fuel, which probably means having to nationalize the fossil fuel companies and then phase them out, and then a real impetus of uh, government planning for sustainable energy. Um, they don't want to go there. I mean, they being the financial sector, the corporate Dems, they don't, they, it's like I said before, they hate socialism more than they hate the end of the world or the risk of the end of the world because they think they're so rich they won't really be hurt by it anyway. Um, so so their policy towards China and many other ways is, is confused because there is no answer for them within the paradigm they're used to working in. You can't use force against China that's going to matter so you can't you know, it doesn't matter how many bases and aircraft carriers, whatever you got. It ain't going to help because you cannot overthrow the Chinese Communist Party and the government. It ain't happening. You can't invade. Even if you were to defend Taiwan, which is a ridiculous thing to try. But let's say, then what? Does it stop China from being the major trading partner, trading partner of practically every country on Earth? I mean, it doesn't change the fundamental equation that China has a billion and a half people, a very successful capitalist economy run by a state. And I'm not going to right now get into the argument whether it's towards socialism or not. I, I don't see it, but whatever. Um, so what do we need is obviously, and, and either we're going to get there or we, ain't gonna, or we aren't going to be here is some sections of American capital have to wake up and say, like FDR did in the 30s, so it's not like there's no precedent for it, and say, for the sake of the capitalist system, 
we need to mitigate what's going on here. So, you know, we got to find a way to cooperate with China on climate. We got to nationalize or pass regulations. The easiest way would just to pay buy these fossil fuel people out. And who are the fossil fuel people that need to get bought out? It's Wall Street. Who the hell owns the fossil fuel companies? You know, it's primarily the same financial institutions. Asset managers. Yeah. I did see a report. Uh, this is more in the EU context, but there was a, a report on, um, I think it was BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, and how they're heavily invested in Chevron and in Exxon. All and, of them. Name yeah. the oil company. Every one of them. Exactly. So they're, in essence, they're contributing to the climate crisis by, you know, investing in these companies. And the effects of these companies are, you know, contributing to climate disasters, to climate migration. And so the, the, the European policymakers are so acutely aware of the fact that, you know, a lot of people will have to flee African countries because of the climate crisis. And so in turn, they're actually investing, the, the European lawmakers are investing more in border and surveillance technologies to patrol their borders to ensure that, you know, it will be much more difficult for people to arrive in Europe. So it's, it's, it's crazy because these same asset managers are also involved in these border and security companies such as Accenture and, you know, all these other surveillance companies. Um, so they're, exacerbating the climate crisis that they're invested in, but they're also invested in the the companies that have the so-called like dual use technology solutions for this crisis. They're, they're just perpetuating it all. And obviously someone needs to put a, a stop to it, but I don't think that will happen until people seriously organize and put pressure on on the politicians, whether it be in the European context or the American context. But that also brings me back to what we were talking about with you know, the oligarchical, oligarchic system in the U.S. and the sort of two-tiered justice system there. So, you know, a racialized poor person can go to jail for possessing a bit of marijuana, but the bankers and other white-collar criminals will commit crimes, you know, with impunity, and they won't get prosecuted. And, I mean, you're older than me. Like, what was it like in the 80s when you saw uh, bankers going to jail for, during the savings and loans crisis and comparing that to today where I, I feel like so many of these crimes are legitimized and encouraged and are so part of the system that if you were to prosecute all of them, that the whole thing would just completely crumble. Well, I don't know about crumbling, but there's a process that's been going on right since the early development, by early, I mean late 19th century, early 20th century development of American capitalism, where because of the needs of modern industry for capital, for these massive factories and machines, banks became much more dominant in their role in the economy. Um, and you can even see by, you know, even into the 1920s, um, the banks had so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. And they so encouraged speculation. Everybody was supposed to buy stock and they, they would loan money left, right to anybody to go buy stock. And the whole thing became a shell game. Um, it, it kind of reduced during the crash, which was to a large extent caused by this. But since World War II, the size and importance and dominance of the financial sector has gone up like a rocket ship. If you look at the charts. Well, the concentration of ownership has never been as concentrated. The amount of wealth in fewer and fewer hands has never been as it is, which means there's less places to invest it productively. So the financial sector has gotten more and more parasitical, uh, investing in crazy synthetic investments. And, you know, subprime was an example. But uh, you know, I think the, the global size of the global derivative market, which is all these crazy things they create to invest in, the size of the derivative market is, is like five or six times larger than the whole global GDP. Um, it's, it, it is, it's insanity. I did a report earlier. The, the Bank for International Settlements did a report which got some coverage in the business press, but almost nowhere else. You know, it warned that there's an impending uh, disaster 
that there's these uh, swaps that take place between the currency swaps, where one side loans, you know, Japan, Japanese loan to the Europeans, and they agree, okay, we'll pay each other back later. And for now, what's at this exchange rate, and later you you get the you know, euros, and we get the yen. And anyway, they warn that there's something, what was it? I think the number was somewhere $60, $70 trillion outstanding in these swaps. And the Bank for International Settlements, which is described as the central bank for central banks, says, well, what happens if, if when it comes time to reverse the swap, this side doesn't have the money? What if we get into a bit of an 07, 08 situation where more than one of these, these swaps can be millions and millions of dollars? What if this starts cascading where people can't fill people, these big sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and governments can't fulfill their side of the swap? The whole thing unravels. And the, the bank BIS was warning that this is like a, another financial 20708 20, waiting to happen. And that's just one, you know, what they call the financial architecture. You look what just happened with this Silicon Valley bank. I mean, there's all kinds of these uh, weak points, fracture points in the global finance system because so much of it's bullshit. So much of it is smoke and mirrors. So much is a shell game. And they have so much money they don't know what to do with. So that parasitism goes right into the politics because these are the guys who can afford to buy Congress or much of Congress. These are the guys that can afford to fund presidential runs and presidential campaigns. And then at every level of the state national assemblies and you know every state senator, I mean, the financial, the clause of the financial sector and how they manipulate the political system, it goes down to, you know, I don't know if they get involved in the race for dog catcher, but it comes pretty close. Uh, I wouldn't surprise me someday they'll start financing the dogs. The, 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 the system itself is getting corrupter and more parasitical. So they get myopic. They, they don't want to see past how much money can I make today. Um, and it's not just the internalized worldview of that. It's, there's something real to it. Like, let's say Larry Fink from BlackRock, who made this great speech about getting out of coal. And he made this thing, oh, we're going to reduce our coal thing. I mean, even then it was mostly BS. But let's say they did it. Okay, they get out of coal. Well, Vanguard gets into coal. They'll pick up what BlackRock sells. And in fact, a group of Republican governors, there's a, there's a group uh, got created by a guy named Mark Carney. He used to be president of the Bank of Canada. Then he was head of the Bank of England. Now he's a special advisor to the UN on climate, he put together a group of financial institutions to develop investing in green sustainable stuff. I, from what I know, it's a lot of greenwashing and a lot of nice talk, but nice talk maybe is better than no talk. Anyway, a group of Republican governors told Vanguard and the others that if you don't get out of this and stop getting on this climate change train, our states won't be won't do business with you anymore. And Vanguard pulled out of this group who are supposedly going to save the earth. So they know only government intervention, only government saying, get out of coal. Market can't get out of coal. Only state regulation and uh, that's a kind of central planning for unfolding green and all the rest. So we need to tell people this and say, you know, don't vote for somebody except in, you know, like I say, it can get complicated with a Christian theocrat. Um, but we have to go knock on doors and talk to people, including people who vote for Trump. And, you know, talk about what's at stake. You know, West Virginia you know, which was primarily a pro-Trump state. But they have a very active union movement. There's lots of people organizing there. But you look at West Virginia, what's coming at two degrees global warming. Half the state is going to be flooded. 
I know we're talking global warming and droughts, but in some places, it's uh, severe storms and severe weather. And you look at the weather map, there ain't much left of West Virginia. You know, people, they got to get how immediate the threat to their own families and livelihood is. But how do we prevent big oil from continuing to engage in enhanced oil recovery, which means, you know, using carbon uh, capture and storage to get more oil out of the ground? Because they have all these ESG nice t terms that they use and, and they're getting money. I mean, the, 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 um, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act allocates some money to, to these companies, right? So that they can engage in, in po policies or, or practices that would get them to net zero by 2030 or by 2050 or whatever. But if so much of what they're doing is actually contributing to more combustion, then, which is the case, we're all screwed. So how do we, how do we like get out of this conundrum and, and rein in big oil? I mean, that's the big question, right? Yeah, and I mean, the Biden plan way too much relies on carbon capture of one sort or another to meet the target. And as far as I understand the situation, there is no evidence that this can be done on a scale, at least in a time frame, that's meaningful. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking, what, seven, eight years to supposedly not get to one five and then two um, and as I said, James Hansen and others think it, two might already bake, be baked in the system. Um, the uh, It's not just carbon capture. I ran into two guys at the airport when I was flying to go see Ellsberg. And they're... You shouldn't have big, been flying out there. Okay. <laughs> and there were two techie guys sitting waiting for our plane, which kept getting delayed. And I listened to them, and they're obviously at a very senior level. So I, I said, listen, I can hear you guys talking, and you, you guys are senior executives in tech. Uh, you must make a lot of money. You must be very smart, because I assume people at senior levels are, are very smart. Although a lot of people fail upward, so I, they just know how to play the system. But sorry. Well, maybe. I think a lot of them are smart. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you're talking hard technology, it's not like Procter & Gamble, which is a lot of bullshit marketing. But, uh, you know, anyway, let's assume they're smart. I said, you know, what are you guys not concerned about the climate crisis? And one guy starts going on about, uh, oh, this tech solution and that tech solution is coming and this and that. And then the other guy's sort of nodding his head along with them. And I said, okay, l let's say you're right. There's some great tech coming. Is there a single piece of evidence that it's going to come in a time frame that wouldn't require us to phase out fossil fuel in order that maybe some of this tech stuff maybe will do something? He was dumbfounded. He, he didn't know what to say. He was kind of, well, I guess not. And then the other guy, I said, well, you know, don't you guys in tech have to take a stand on this? It doesn't matter. Sure, let's have some great tech solutions. If it's possible, who would be against it? But every single piece of evidence is none of, none of it could be effective without phasing out fossil fuel quickly. And he agreed. And I said, you know, and I said, you know, I, I made this film about wrestling. I said, you and I guess I include myself too and, and others. You know, I said, you know, when you go to a wrestling show, you suspend disbelief. You don't believe it's real hitting and kicking, but to enjoy it, get on with your life, you, you suspend your disbelief and then you talk yourself into believing it really is. Well, I says that that's what we're doing with climate. We know these guys are not, the government, the elites are not going to deal with it. Market forces aren't going to deal with it, but we suspend that disbelief and get on with our lives. So we have to we have to kind of get people to stop doing that. You know, this whole culture is based on suspended disbelief. When everybody in their heart of heart knows, when I say everybody, maybe some people don't believe in climate, but they also don't think the elites that do believe in climate are going to do anything good. So, so wake up. Yeah, we need to somehow communicate that to people because I, I think over 
several decades, some climate movements have thought that, you know, you don't want to scare people too much because then that will sort of make them not want to do anything that will make them passive or that will just incapacitate them and they'll just get so frustrated or lose all sense of hope that they won't do anything whatsoever. But I, I don't know. I hope that with, you know, the younger generations as well, that they just really realize that, you know, they have, they, they don't own the means of production. Like they're the amount of assets that they have, especially gener people who are like 20 to 25, like they compared to previous generations, they really are in a terrible financial position. They have an incredible amount of debt. Like, I think they're really acutely w aware of how expensive things have become, how scarce resources are. And so I think that is definitely the generation who hopefully will put more pressure on politicians to do something. But again, if these politicians are completely bought out by the big oil lobby, then what do you do? That's the big question. Well, the, what the Biden administration has done on climate is far, far from what's needed. It is something. This last big piece of legislation, this anti-inflation thing, I don't know why they called it that. I mean, it is more money into sustainable energy, electric cars, and this and that. And there is some other policy that is reducing carbon emission in the United States. It's, it's certainly not nothing. It's not enough. But it's not climate science denial. So you go back to this where we started this conversation, if you get a uh, Christian nationalist Trump or Trumpism without Trump in power, say goodbye to all that, any kind of climate legislation. Uh, say goodbye to anything to do with reducing fossil fuel and so on. Uh, and, and you're going to, you know, the rollback will be enormous. And then the power, if they start getting more power again in state governments. Now, there have been, you know, recently, this abortion issue and some other issues, the, you know, some of the far right have lost elections. Uh, Trump didn't win the last election. Uh, in certain states like Michigan, uh, they were able to defeat the far right. Um, it's not nothing. Uh, and the other issue is... Uh, Maybe it won't be in the United States, not maybe, more more than likely, where a breakthrough will happen. You know, maybe in Brazil, if, if Lula gets it together there and, you know, maybe there'll be some other big economies. Uh, the, the economy, in some ways, I don't quite understand why they don't do more is China. China's not a fossil fueling, fuel producing country. They don't, you know, have something so direct to gain. Um, and I know they seem to have a plan to transition, uh, but it's from all accounts, I understand not nearly quickly enough. And, and, and they're still building, what is it? A new coal electric outfit every week. And they're still producing and buying coal. Um, you know, the, the U S in many ways is worse, but it doesn't matter. I don't, the U.S. is what, I think the number one producer of fossil fuel in one way or the other. The, you know, they say natural gas is so much better, but my understanding is that maybe it's better than coal, but it's still not helping us avoid the kind of crisis that we're heading towards. So again, you know, it's, it's funny us with Ukraine, you know, China's kind of in the position for its own narrow self-interest to be far more of a leader on this than it is. Uh, but right now, I don't think there's any climate negotiation between China and the United States going on at all. Which is nuts because we all live on the same planet. So we need like the, the West needs to actively negotiate with China to meet any climate goals in the future. There's no way around that, especially after years of outsourcing emissions to China by exporting all the manufacturing jobs to China. They've essentially, or the West has essentially outsourced all of their emissions to China. That's why China's, you know, the largest emitter. And if you want to include China in that to tackle climate change, you have to work together with China. Yeah, there's no doubt. And it's not all on the American side. The Chinese could be doing more to try to negotiate and making more of an issue out of it than they are. But then 
what would that mean with Russia as a you know it's mostly a fossil fuel economy? Um, I mean, one can just hope that you know hope and, and and support those and organize that amongst ordinary people everywhere there's a, a movement that embraces and the climate crisis and the, the risk of nuclear weapons um, and people's economic issues uh, and, and not just in the US but in other countries and 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 try to tone down the the war hysteria that's going on uh, because uh, it's drowning out the the dire threat we're facing well, I do wonder if the war hysteria is actually just more apparent where we are in the West. And I have a feeling that people in, in other parts of the world maybe don't pay attention to that as much. Like they're more acutely aware of some of the economic issues they're facing. And they know that that's, of course, tied to the global economy and to the war in Ukraine and, and, and other issues. But they probably have a completely different perception of it and maybe they're not. Yeah, I think you're right. But they certain, but I think people in the global South, a lot, large numbers get the climate threat and, and they're going to be more immediately affected or are already being immediately affected. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think the war hysteria over Ukraine is far more in Europe and North America uh, than a lot of other places. And, you know, it's understandable. But the uh, I, I don't know yet how we I don't know how we break through the uh, the fog, except through what we're doing. Well, it was great talking to you, Paul. Same. Thank you. And thanks for making time for this conversation. And thank you for watching the analysis news. If you're in a position to donate, please go to our website, theanalysis.news, hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen, and most importantly, get on the mailing list. Sign up for the mailing list so that you'll be informed every time a new episode is published. And also go to our YouTube channel, The Analysis News, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell and make sure that you select all episodes so that you're notified every time an episode drops. See you next time.